Hi, it's Jesse. Welcome to another turning. Today I am drinking some Choice Organics Earl Grey tea. Not normally an Earl Grey girl, but today I'm just kind of in the mood. So, welcome to the channel. Enjoy my massive and sipping stack of my bright mums. Um, today we are doing my highs and lows for winter of 2022-2023. No, December to January, February. I didn't, the last one of these I did, the last one of these I did was for spring of 2022. I recorded a summer one. It's edited. If you're interested in seeing that, let me know. I will post it. Um, otherwise, this is where we're at. I didn't even do a fall one. So maybe I'll play a little catch up if you're interested. But for right now, let's just dive into my favorite and least favorite books for this winter. I did not have nearly as many four stars books, four plus star books this season as I normally do, or at least it feels like I didn't. I didn't even count these this time. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. I had 15. That seems like about the same number. I don't know. For some reason, it feels kind of low. I also, in this time, had three DNFs um, and quite a few rereads. Maybe that's why it feels off, because I had like three or four rereads in this time period. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I, um... These are gonna be in roughly in order, not really, but roughly least to most favorite, at least based on their ratings, but like, not really. First up is A Contract in Soul Form by Alain Arche and Christopher Warman. I got an arc of this. It's my first arc, so it, that might be influencing this if I'm being entirely honest, not really. Um, this is the kind of sequel or companion to Seasons of Albadon. Um, in theory, they can be read in any order, but like chronologically, Seasons of Albadon does come first, and I would recommend reading Seasons of Albadon before A Contract in Soul Form. That said, this really changes the scope and the tone of the series in a way I kind of wasn't expecting. So, Seasons of Albadon is very fairy tale esque. It's dark fairy tale. It's four kind of short stories that are kind of interconnected um, following this small town. And something happens at the end of that one, which we won't talk about because that's spoilers. This takes place sometime after that. There's been a short time jump and we're following a two characters. Um, Valen is a genie, a djinn, um, who has been given kind of life. She's been given freedom, but not entirely. The world still relies on her doing other bidding because if she doesn't, something disastrous will happen. So every once in a while she gets this urging where she has to create a contract with somebody and fulfill it. Um, and then we also meet DeNovo, Doravan. Why do I want to call him DeNovo so bad? Doravan, who is the son of a disgraced, no or not disgraced noble. His father was a noble, but after his father died, his uncle kind of ruined their house. Uh, and he wants, he's like a 16 year old boy and he wants nothing more than to become a, a lord again and they are such fascinating characters and that's ultimately why this bit gets a place on this list is because of the characters i love valen i love i didn't realize i didn't realize until i read this book how much i love an immortal character that's not jaded valen sees how the world has changed and she's excited by it she's wary of it for sure but she's also excited by it and i love that and then Dorvin, yeah, Dorvin, for how much I hated him, I also was almost always sympathetic for him. And that's such an interesting balance to strike. And I really feel like they do such a fantastic, fantastic job striking that balance. Like, I, I mean, he's awful. He's absolutely awful, but he's also a kid. And you are always reminded that this is a kid and that he doesn't, it's not that he doesn't know better, but he's learning. And I think it's really amazing. And I really think everybody should read these. Um, I think between the two of them, I do think I like Seasons of Albagon more. But I do just love a short, dark fairy tale so much. It's hard to really beat this. But this does have me really excited for where the rest of the series is going to go. Next up is The 30 Names of Night by Zane Jokahar. Jokahar? I hope I said that right. Um, this is contemporary well magical realism 
which is not a genre I dive into frequently. But this is about um, a young trans boy whose mother is, pa it's the anniversary of his mother's passing. And at the time of the story, he hasn't really come out yet. And he's still kind of dealing with familiar pressure from his grandmother and his sister. Um, and it's just this told in parallel with this artist that his mom um, was a big fan of, that he found her journal. There's a lot of stuff going on, but he found this artist's journal. So we're telling the story back and forth between him and this artist who, as it turns out, is also queer. Um, and it is just brilliant and it was beautiful. And it's one of those ones when I was like looking at this list, I was like, I really love that, but I don't know if I remember it enough to talk about it. How can I include it? But then as I started talking, I was like, oh yeah, there was that and that. It was beautiful and it's one of those ones I seriously would consider rereading um, because it was just absolutely beautiful. And I loved the audiobook, but it's also one I kind of want to read physically and really immerse myself in. I can't really say much more about that because it is something that like the feelings it gave me are sticking with it, but the story isn't. Not that the story isn't, but the story isn't sticking with me in a way I know how to talk about it. It was beautifully written. Um, really compelling ideas of you know being true to who you are but not in like a contrite way in a we recognize that this is difficult especially because these characters are also arab and so having that compounding element and it was just really beautiful there's some lovely found family but also lovely exploration of you know biological family the connection he has with his sister and his grandmother are both absolutely it's wonderful. It's it, it was really wonderful. All right, next one on here is The Annual Migration of Clouds by Premi Muhammad. This is one that had been on my list to read a while and I intentionally read it first thing in the year. I try to start the year off with something I think I'm gonna like at least, not necessarily love. And I absolutely adored this book. Um, this is a post-apocalyptic novel, but like far post-apocalyptic. So things have kind of circled back around. It, this is the normal now. It's not like, everything scary and spooky no it's like we have come up with our own routines and it was some sort of pandemic that kind of wiped out the world and there's still remnants of it but there's people that mostly just live with it like it kills them eventually it's a slow process but like at this point it's just something you know if you have it people try to stay away from you but it's not too bad um and it's genetic it, it, there is definitely such a rich background for this story that doesn't get explored nearly enough and i want to know more like i want the story of this pan because the idea is that it's this symbiotic um parasite that has infected people but it doesn't really get activated until like several generations later so it like stays in the genetic line anyway we have this girl who has this but she lives in this society that lives in an old like what used to be a university. Um, and she has just been accepted to a school. And this theoretically is a place she would have to travel to that is much more advanced than where she is now. It's, it's a place that managed to stay together during the apocalypse. Um, but nobody really knows if it exists or not. Uh, and there's also just like a lot of pressure against her leaving that like her community needs her. They can't really afford to lose people. So there's a lot of elements of that fear of leaving of I'm abandoning people. She also has her mother is sick and needs her. And it's just so many layers of that same element you get in a lot of contemporary stories, like contemporary coming of age stories that YA new adults vein of like I have this opportunity to better myself do I take it even though it means abandoning people that rely on me it's that story but it's wrapped up in so many layers of she doesn't even know if this is real and also the way they need her are aren't just like my family's financially it's an entire community relying on not her specifically but like anyone and she just kind of goes down this pseudo self-destructive path because of this because she's trying to gain independence but also 
and it's so good. And then there's this added element of this parasite tries to preserve its host, right? Because if the host of the parasite dies, the parasite dies and it can't pass itself on. And so there's a lot of really interesting, nuanced, weird discussion about free will of, you know, things will happen. And she's like, am I making this decision because I'm making this decision or am I making this decision because the parasite is making me make this decision so that I can't die or I don't get hurt? It is so good and it's so tiny. Um, and I really, really want to read more Premium Muhammad. I also read In What Can We Offer You Tonight by them, which was also very good, but didn't quite make the cut here because I really, I liked this one more, but they're both very good. So I need to read more from this author. Next, Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This book is about this, these two women, they're married. Um, and one of them works in submarines and she goes on a research trip in a submarine that takes much, much longer than it was supposed to. And when she comes back, she's just kind of different. And it's her perspective in flashbacks about what happened in the submarine. And then it's her wi wife's perspective in seeing her come back and seeing what she's going through. And it's a lot about loss and grief, but also not, it's about trauma and supporting somebody with trauma. And it is so good. It is also a tiny book. I think I just love tiny books. Um, and it's beautifully written. And it's some of the, I think one of the like quotes on it is something like the most erotic story I've ever read or something like that, because it is. And not like erotic in the modern sense of erotic, but erotic in a more traditional sense of what that word means, where it is just full of passion and caring and love. And I, I don't know, you can't read the book without seeing just how much these two people care for each other and how much, I can't remember either of their names, but the wife, the one that stayed on the surface, like how much she cares for her. And there's elements of mourning somebody before they're even dead. And it's so beautiful and I really recommend it. It's just, it's so good. And finally, number five, my honestly, definitely, normally I don't rank these, but definitely my favorite of these three months. And I am putting money on probably being one of my favorite, if not my favorite books of the year. Meet Me in Another Life by Catriona Sylvie. This is, oof, how do I describe this? This is about Thora and what's that man's name? Santi, man and a woman, um, who are living different lives together. Um, I don't really know how to say more than that because I think it's very intriguing to see their lives play out together. I want to correctly set expectations early that this is not a romance because reading the reviews, most of the negative reviews were people saying, I expected this to be a romance and it wasn't because it's not. It's not a romance. Um, like to give you some set of expectations. The first life, Sylvie and Thor, Sylvie. Um, <laughs> um, Santi and Thorin are college students and they meet like at like a college mixer, right? And that kind of sets up that like, oh, maybe this is a romance. Like here's one chance where it didn't work out because of X, Y, Z, but it's not. Um, Cause the next time, uh, I think it's the next one. If Thorin is a teacher and, or not Thorin, sorry. Santi is a teacher and Thorin is his middle school student. Like, that's what you should expect from this. They are living different lives. They're the same people, but they're living different lives, but it's drastically different lives. And they're always connected to each other, but in drastically different ways. Important <laughs> caveat to set. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. This is by far, in my opinion, the best exploration of different lives I've ever seen. You know, alternate realities, alternate timelines I've ever seen. I think Sylvie does such a fantastic job of making these characters recognizable through each of these lives. And I can't spoil it, but to the point where there's some plot twists that rely on that, that rely on the characters being so recognizably them. But they're also believably different because how you grow up does change who you are and that's a big theme of the book is the idea that how much of you is destined how much are you destined to become this kind of person and how much can change based on what happens around you but it 
And there's also a lot of other things that get explored later that I can't really talk about because it spoils something that happens, but also very good. Um, and I loved it. And I also really, really loved the exploration of platonic love. Like I said, it's not a romance. Santi and Thorn actually each have their own love interest, which is also an element that gets explored that's beautiful and I love the way it's done. But they have their own love interest. But they are drawn to each other and connected to each other and love each other. They care for each other. But it's not romance. And it's so well done. It is so beautifully done. And it just really got me wanting to read more stories with these kind of platonic connections. So if you have recommendations for platonic, and I'm not talking familial because I do think that can be done well, but I'm talking like platonic love, like for the closest of friends, you know? Not even friends, like I wouldn't even, it's weird. I don't know if I would describe Santi and um, Thorin as friends in this. What I, I don't know, it's complicated. It's, it's so well done. It's so beautiful and it's so good. And I absolutely love it. And this is definitely one of those books that went on the list for me to buy a copy for myself eventually because it deserves to live up here. It deserves to be there. Um, it was just so good. So good. I, I, I want to gush about it more, but like so much I want to say about it is spoilers. And the fact that it's like, this is like the second or third book I read this year. Let me see. One, two, three, four. It's the fourth book I started reading this year, but probably the third one I finished. Yeah. Um, and I just, it stuck with me until now. And that says so much about it as a book that I could tell you so many of the details of this book. I could probably recite the entire plot to you. And that says the impact it has on me. Um, I remember the characters' names. That really says something. Oh, it's just, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Am I going to end up rereading it right now? I'm just going to go pick it up from the library and read it right now. I shouldn't do that. All right, let's go to Lowe's. I don't really have a lot to talk about here. I have the three DNFs, but none of these were DNFs because they were, well, one of them was. Um, yeah, one of them was. All right, three DNFs. I'm just going to quickly talk through them. Um, Night of the Living Res just didn't click with me. It was one of those ones. I read it. I had to go to bed. I woke up in the morning and I was like, I don't remember what happened and I don't care what happened. So I just stopped it. Chasing Whispers, I read the intro to um, and hated so much that I was like, I'm going to try this. And like the sec, I was like, no, this isn't going to work. It was too pretentious. It's just not for me. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't for me. And then I read A Dance with Dragons for uh, by the George R. R. Martin um, for a video I was going to do, but I think I'm canceling. Um, and I ended up DNFing it like maybe 20% in. I don't even think I was that far in uh, because I just could not. I, I could not. Like there was a lot of fat phobia and body shaming and, you know, the kind of misogynistic content you accept. But then there's a scene where Tyrion meets somebody and make some really disgusting transphobic comics. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep pushing through this. I'm done. Um, so I DNF that one. So that one was DNF because I didn't like it. Not because it just wasn't clicking with me. That one I think is actually bad. And I think we maybe should stop spotting George R. R. Martin. Because uh, two lows to talk about. One I'm not going to talk about very much. Because it's in another video that should be coming out very soon. I just need to edit it. Um, or did I already put it? Wrong Place, Wrong Time. I read this for my booktube favorites, reading booktubers' favorites, and kind of hated it. Um, you can watch that vlog to see my actual thoughts on it. The general gist of it, though, is just, like, I didn't care. The book never made me care. And then the ending was dumb and actively made the book worse. Uh, and then the other one I also don't want to talk about too long, more because I don't want to give it more attention than it deserves um is Arco the Dark Union by UW Leo so a friend of mine messaged me at the beginning of the year she was like hey I saw this TikTok about a way to read books and make money are you interested um so we both kind of looked into it and we're like this seems like I'm not gonna get rich off of it it's not gonna replace my day job but you know I can make a couple extra bucks every month reading books and that's something I do anyway so I signed up for it and I've read two whole books and didn't like either one of them, which I, to be honest, did not expect to really like the books. Um, because this whole, the, the, anyway, 
Um, but also I just had a bad experience working with them. So if you're interested in that, let me know below if you'd like to know more about what that experience was like, because my partner thinks I should do a video about it, but like, that's not the kind of video I normally do. But if you'd like to know my thoughts about that, let me know below and I will make a video about it. That said, this book, Arco the Dark Union by UW Leo, was the most boring book I've ever read in my life. And that's why I feel like it needs, it deserves to be here. Um, so this is a middle grade book. And I'm gonna tell you some of the things that are in it and you're gonna be like, wow, Jesse, that sounds awesome. And I'm here to tell you it wasn't. Uh, so this is about these kids in South America. Their parents are all doing research on Mayan, Aztec, Aztec, I think. I don't remember. Um, stuff, although it doesn't make sense why any of them are there because it's like a physicist and a biologist. Well, maybe the biologist, there's a reason. But like, Anyway, their parents are in a research group, and so all these kids are here, and they're exploring, and they're hanging out, and they come across a secret hidden temple. And then throughout the book, and I don't care if you would consider this spoilers, I genuinely don't care, uh, they find dinosaur eggs, and manage to hatch the dinosaur eggs, and then find out that these dinosaur eggs were pterodactyl eggs specifically, pterosaur eggs specifically. And then they find out that these eggs were left here by aliens that left this temple that periodically visited Earth anytime Earth was in a moment of crisis to help set Earth on the back right um, <coughs> path again. So last time they had visited Earth happened to be during the Aztec Mayan time period, which is really questionable because it's like if you showed up during that time, you could you couldn't have stopped some stuff from happening. But also these kids then use these pterosaurs to fight, uh, to do eco-terrorism. They do an eco-terrorism. <laughs> anyway, all of that sounds incredibly exciting. And the book itself was just so boring. There were absolutely zero stakes. One of the kids gets, uh, again, this is spoilers. If you, for some reason, were like, I was going to read this book. You shouldn't be listening at this point, I guess. Um, one of the kids gets, like, tel telepathy powers. And, like, after that point, nothing is a risk anymore. He can just, like, mind control people to leave them alone. It's like, what is the point of this? Um, <coughs> he, uh, th it's, it's so boring. There are no stakes. These kids have barely any personality, and their parents, who are also main characters, have absolutely no personality. You get one girl, her father is the crazy one, and he's the one, only one with any personality. And then of the five kids, I could not tell you... I mean, like, I could tell you there were, like, archetypes. So there was Abby was the one that, like, worries. Um, she's the doctor of the group. Her mom's the biologist. Um, then you have Ben is the one that gets the magic powers. He's the one get, that gets injected with, like, alien nonsense. Uh, you have Gaia. Her dad's the crazy one. Gaia's the cool, awesome girl. Uh, in the cover of the book, she has the biggest hair. Um, she doesn't want Anyway, I'm not, not going to try to process that. Um, and then there's two other boys that I couldn't tell you anything about. Um, one of them makes tea. <sighs> you know? And that's five kids. And that's what I've learned about five of, all five of them over the course of the entire book. And again, their parents, nothing. I mean, Abby's mom is basically her, but an adult. She worries all the time and she can fix injuries. Um, but other than that. One of them's American, and he is the most stereotype of an American. Like, he's the one that brought a gun. I... It's so funny, but it was such a bad book. Anyway, that has been my highs and lows for the winter of 22 to 23. Let me know what you think of these books below. Based on my thoughts, let me know. Or based on what I like, maybe recommend me some books. I like getting book recs because it goes on a long list of books I read. Maybe someday. It's funny, I'm looking at this, I'm like, how many of these were actually on my wants or anyway. Love y'all, bye. <laughs>